Okay, we're back after a brief hiatus for the third in this four-part lecture series, Marks After Growth. In case you're just tuning in for the first time, my name's Sean O'Brien, and I'm a research fellow at Birkbeck at the University of London. As always, big thanks go out to the 87 Press and the editing team. In the previous lecture on what's been called the esoteric marks, which you can find along with the rest of the lectures in the series on the 87's blog, The Hive, I explored a subterranean current of Marxian thought distinct from the exoteric Marx of the workers' movement. This esoteric Marxism, sometimes called value form theory, finds its roots in the abstract conceptual logic of Marx's critique of political economy and his emphasis on the objective but non-empirical character of value, a supranatural property of the commodity that is purely social and exists only as a relation, and must therefore assume various forms of appearance as it passes through its cycle of valorization, money, commodity, profit, and so on. Marx describes this value relation as something with a phantom-like objectivity, an actually existing or real abstraction that emerges in the act of exchange, which necessarily abstracts from the concrete characteristics of commodities in order to render them commensurable as values. So the abstraction that emerges from exchange is a product not of human thought, but one of human action. Okay, but talk of actually existing abstractions that can't be empirically verified can get you labeled a fanatic, prone to flights of fancy, and not just by the positivists. As Alberto Toscano has argued, the denigration of so-called abstractionists is a tendency shared by figures as disparate as Edmund Burke and Bruno Latour who both equate, quote, critical negativity with religious zealotry. Perhaps this is why Marx's value theory was largely neglected by Marxists. The theory of value is something supranatural that transcends sensuousness, as Marx puts it, distinguishes his own approach not only from that of classical political economy, but also from much of what has been called traditional orthodox or worldview Marxism, which tends, like classical political economy, to treat capitalist categories like value, the commodity, and money as natural and transhistorical forms. This traditional Marxism tends to affirm the labor theory of value as a universal truth in human society, insisting that labor is the substance of value, that value quite literally is embodied in the commodity, and that the magnitude of value embodied in the commodity is determined by the amount of labor socially necessary for its production. Like classical political economy, traditional Marxism never asks, quote, why labor is expressed in value, and why the measurement of labor by its duration is expressed in the magnitude of the value of the product. That's Marx. As a result, then, traditional Marxism also misses how the phantom-like objectivity of value constitutes a form of objective domination. So unlike ancient slave societies and medieval feudal societies in which one group is ruled by another in a form of direct or personal domination and dependency, capitalist domination involves no personal relationship of domination or direct relationship of force. Legally and formally speaking, capitalists and laborers are free and equal, but in reality, both are bound by forms of objective constraint that are historically unique to capitalist society. Capitalists are compelled to put the profit motive before any other concern if they wish to survive in the market, while workers who own nothing but their labor power are compelled to seek wage work in order to survive. As Michael Heinrich puts it, quote, capitalism rests on a systemic relationship of domination that produces constraints to which both workers and capitalists are subordinated. In other words, proletarians are forced by the given conditions of their existence to quite literally go searching for their own subordination in the form of waged work, since, as Michael Denning notes, quote, under capitalism, the only thing worse than being exploited is not being exploited, end quote. In this way, the capitalist mode of production constitutes an historically distinct society in which human beings are, quote, ruled by abstractions, as Marx says, rather than by individuals or institutions. This is what Moisha Postone means to emphasize when he writes that, quote, 
the abstract domination and the exploitation of labor characteristic of capitalism are grounded ultimately not in the appropriation of surplus by the non-laboring classes, but in the form of labor in capitalism, end quote. And here we might recall from the previous lecture Norbert Trenkel's description of abstract labor as a merciless sovereign that shapes the form of labor through violent historical processes. Highlighting Marx's own emphasis on the crucial and consistently overlooked importance of the form of value, Postone offers a succinct summation of the difference between traditional Marxism and Marx's own method of form analysis in terms of a distinction between, on the one hand, a critique of capitalism from the standpoint of labor, and on the other, a critique of labor in capitalism. Postone associates critique from the standpoint of labor with class-centered readings of Marx, which position the proletariat as subject of history. Arguing against such approaches, Postone emphasizes Marx's characterization of capital as an automatic subject and argues that class struggle is in fact, quote, structurally intrinsic to capital. As you can imagine, this, pro this position has been met with fierce criticism from a number of corners, perhaps most notably from within the strand of Marxian theory associated with the German new reading of Marx in a series of arguments advanced by Werner Bomfeld to which I'll return in the final lecture on the history of the class relation. For now, though, I want to emphasize how this argument in Marx unfolds at a high degree of abstraction. As I mentioned in the opening lecture, Marx analyzes the capitalist mode of production at what he describes as its ideal average. So while Marx is, of course, aware that capitalism only ever exists in concrete historical forms, his aim is to analyze, quote, the internal organization of the capitalist mode of production. In other words, the features which make it distinct historically. This is why Marx begins capital with the systematic development of a series of categories and only turns to the historical account at the end of volume one, in the final section on so-called primitive accumulation and the emergence of the free wage worker as a precondition for the establishment of the capital labor relation. In the Grundrisse, Marx describes this mode of presentation as a method, quote, of rising from the abstract to the concrete, and we're going to follow suit here. That is to say, in this lecture, I want to shift gears from an abstract analysis of capital at its ideal average to the concrete history of capital accumulation over the long durée. Rather than oppose logic to history, however, our aim, like Marx's own, will be to determine the extent to which abstract categories of the critique of political economy can illuminate the concrete history of capitalism. There's a diverse body of work that emerged in the wake of the capitalist restructuring of the 1970s and aims to offer periodizing models that can help explain what happened in that pivotal moment and why. In what follows, I'll lean primarily on the work of Giovanni Arrighi and Robert Brenner and the debates the two have had over this very moment of transition, but it's worth remembering that they're by no means the only Marxists who have offered frameworks for periodizing the transformations in global capital that marked the late 20th century. Michelle Aglietta, for instance, also responded to the economic restructuring of the 1970s by attempting to construct a historical model of capital accumulation adequate to the emergence of new economic and social forms. Emphasizing the role institutions play in the regulation of the capitalist economy, Aglietta founds his theory of regulation on two interrelated formulations central to the French regulation school, the regime of accumulation and the mode of regulation. So a regime of accumulation is a historically bounded and relatively stable system comprising production, circulation, consumption, and distribution, while a mode of regulation refers to the institutional networks of governance that provide supportive environments for a given regime of accumulation. Together, they form what the regulationists call a mode of development. When tensions between the regime of accumulation and the mode of regulation reach a critical point, a structural crisis ensues, and from the chaos and conflict of crisis, a new mode of development eventually emerges.
Marx's categories of absolute and relative surplus value, which we discussed in a previous lecture, form the basis of the regulation school's periodizing model, which correspond in their theory to extensive and intensive regimes of accumulation, understood respectively in terms of the domination of one over the other in a given phase of capitalist development. As Aglietta argues, quote, under the regime of extensive accumulation, where absolute surplus value predominates, the length of the working day is the principal means of extracting surplus labor, end quote. For the regulation school, the extensive regime of accumulation leads from most of the 19th century until the rise of Tayloristic or Taylorist scientific management around World War I, under which investments in fixed capital increased productivity rates and cheapened consumer goods. Taylorism thus marks the advent of the intensive regime of accumulation, but remains unstable in their account until the shift following the Great Depression of the 1930s from the competitive to the monopolistic mode of regulation. The combination then of an intensive regime of accumulation and a monopolistic mode of regulation inaugurates a mode of development they call Fordism. So this is the term many of you will be very familiar with. This is sort of one of the kind of key origins of that term. Aglietta and the periodizing models offered by the regulation school have proven influential for a number of thinkers interested in the relationship between cycles of accumulation and cycles of struggle. And their periodizing frameworks, organized around the categories of absolute and relative surplus value, reflect those advanced by Thierry Communiste, which we'll look at in lecture four. But it's worth noting here that, as Robert Brenner and Mark Glick have argued, quote, where capitalist social property relations are fully established, we can, all else being equal, expect to find development on the, on the basis of relative surplus value. It's on this point that Brenner and Glick reject the notion of an extensive regime of accumulation grounded in absolute, value, absolute surplus value extraction, given that capitalist production tends to cheapen consumer goods through productivity increases from the outset, which suggests that it doesn't really make sense to talk about a period of formal subsumption. Brenner's own account of the history of capitalist development and in particular of the agrarian origins of capitalism in England caused widespread debate in the 1970s. With the defeat of the English peasant revolts and the introduction of tenant farming in Great Britain in the 1400s, Brenner argues, feudal tribute was eliminated and the profit motive was established, sparking an explosion in agricultural productivity that paved the way for industrial development. This position is commonly referred to as the Brenner thesis and the debate it triggered, known as the Brenner debate, which played out largely in the pages of the journal Past and Present, laid the foundations for the school of Marxist historical analysis called political Marxism. These days, however, Brenner is increasingly well known for his account of the transition from long boom to long downturn in the late 20th century. In the Economics of Global Turbulence, Brenner argues that, quote, the evolution of the advanced capitalist economies since World War II naturally divides itself into roughly two equal parts, each about a quarter century in length, a period of prosperity from the later 40s to, the 19, to 1973, and an era of slowed growth and increasing economic turbulence from 1973 onwards, marked by deeper recessions and the return of devastating financial crises absent since the Great Depression." End quote. For Brenner, Capitalist competition tends to produce global overcapacity, exerting downward pressure on prices and lowering returns on capital investments. As a result, profitability declines, which in turn places downward pressure on wages and triggers rising unemployment rates. In Brenner's account, overcompetition between the US, Germany, and Japan reached a point of saturation in the early 1970s, leading to a protracted period of economic downturn. As Brenner notes, quote, average rates of growth of output, capital stock investment, and real wages for the years 1973 to the present have been one third to one half of those for the years 1950 to 73, while the average unemployment rate has been more than double. As I mentioned earlier, the other major figure on whose work I'll draw in this overview of the history of accumulation is Giovanni Arrighi, a sociologist and world systems theorist 
whose theory of historical capitalism has also proved widely influential in recent years. In particular, his magisterial book, The Long 20th Century, which was the result of nearly three decades of research. Origi's point of departure for his landmark study is the widespread observation that since the 1970s, something has changed fundamentally in the structure of the capitalist world system. He notes a series of shifts that have occurred. First, a greater geographical mobility of capital. This is sometimes called globalization, right? A term world system theorists, though, don't tend to use, since in their account, globalization has actually been underway for centuries. Second, a shift from Fordism, with its regulated forms of production in the factory, to the flexible forms of accumulation associated with so-called post-Fordism. So once again, we can see the influence of the uh, regulation school here. Third, the decline of the Keynesian social democratic promise and the post-war post welfare state system, usually associated with the rise of neoliberalism. And finally, the rise of the fire sector, so finance, insurance, and real estate, and the explosion of financial markets, which have claimed an ever greater share of GDP since the 1970s. So Origi is concerned with all of these shifts, but wants to broaden the scope and scale of the analysis to place these developments within the longer history of capital accumulation. Quote, once we stretch the space-time horizon of our observations and theoretical conjectures, Origi writes, tendencies that seem novel and unpredictable begin to look familiar. In his structuralist account of late 20th century developments in the capitalist world system, Origi adopts Fernand Braudel's model of the long durée, which Michael Ermoth characterizes as a mode of historical time, quote, not as it presents itself to the existential awareness of modern man, i.e. as the dramatic spectacle of surface events, but rather the deeper rhythms and structures hidden in the layers underneath. Over the course of his research, Arigi notes something interesting. In the history of capitalism, there are a series of cycles of accumulation or long centuries, each associated with a hegemonic center in which an era of material expansion reaches a pinnacle as competition begins to exert downward pressure on the rate of profit, at which point capital abandons commodity production and leaps into liquidity. In Arigi's model of systemic cycles of accumulation and long centuries, each cycle is made up of three phases, and the transition from the first phase to the second constitutes an epoch of material expansion in which commodity production is central. Then the transition from the second to the third phase can be understood as a shift from production to circulation, where profit is sought through financial trading as capital becomes more mobile and flexible. As Arigi writes, quote, in phases of material expansion, money capital sets in motion an increasing mass of commodities, including commoditized labor power and gifts of nature. And in phases of financial expansion, an increasing mass of money capital sets itself free from its commodity form and accumulation proceeds through financial deals. Arigi develops this framework from a reinterpretation of Marx's general formula for capital, which we discussed in the first lecture, right, MCM prime, whereby monetary value congeals in the commodity form only on the condition that it be realized at a profit. Here, M or money means liquidity and flexibility, while C or commodity capital means investments in industry and manufacture. Origi uses this expanded understanding of the formula to describe two epochs in a given cycle of accumulation. So the first epoch, the moment of material expansion, is one in which capitalism moves from its mercantilist phase to its industrialist phase. During this epoch, a new hegemon rises to dominance in the capitalist world system. So this is the move from circulation to production, or from M to C. Then the second epoch is the moment of financial expansion, where industrial production ceases to be sufficiently profitable, and so profit is thought through financial transactions. This then is the movement from production to circulation or from C to M prime. Following on from this model, Arigi identifies four systemic cycles of accumulation, each increasing in scope and intensity, but contracting in duration. So there's a Genoese cycle from the 15th to the early 17th centuries, a Dutch cycle from the late 16th century through most of the 18th century, 
a British cycle from the latter half of the 18th century through the early 20th century, and a US cycle which began in the late 19th century and has continued into the current phase of financial expansion. And so you can see here on this, at this point, I think somewhat famous chart, the way in which each cycle of accumulation uh, increases in scope and intensity, but contracts in duration and also how they overlap. And you can see as well how it's based on Braudel's um, uh, model of the long durée. So each systemic cycle of accumulation then follows a tripartite schema, as Arrighi puts it, beginning with a phase of debt-financed mercantilism, followed by a phase of industrial expansion, and coming to close with a phase of financialization, the last of which constitutes a period of hegemonic transfer, characterized in Arrighi's words by systemic chaos and internecine conflict. So then the three parts, the tripartite schema is made up these three moments the first, mercantilism, where goods are bought on the cheap and sold at a higher price, as in the West Virginia Company or the East India Company. In mercantilism, it's important to note that there's no production taking place, so it's a zero-sum economy. You're effectively buying cheap and selling dear. That's how profit is generated. The second is industrialism, where wealth is generated through commodity production on an increasing scale, as in the Industrial Revolution in Britain, or the post-war golden age and booming economy of 20th century US consumer capitalism. And finally, financialization, where capital, having exhausted the profitability of manufacture, moves away from commodity production into trading, or financial trading uh, specifically, so making money off of money as in uh, Marx's abbreviated formula MM prime, e.g. stock exchange activity, loans, debt, etc. So Origi illustrates how periods of material expansion reach a point of market saturation. As we noted, right, capitalist competition begins to exert downward pressure on the rate of profit, at which point finance capital comes to dominate the hegemonic power, manipulating policy often in a scramble to restore profitability. And we're going to look in a little bit at sort of what that means, particularly around so-called monetary policy or the monetarist revolution of the Reagan-Thatcher era. For a time, financial expansion appears to signal renewed prosperity, but, and this is crucial, this is actually an illusion concealing a crisis of overaccumulation. As Braudel puts it in seasonal terms, Every capitalist development of this order seems, by reaching the stage of financial expansion, to have in some sense announced its maturity. It's a sign of autumn. So usually for a declining hegemon, uh, autumn means spring for the next, right? Autumn for the declining hegemon means spring for the next, although it remains unclear how this transition might ultimately unfold in present circumstances, and we'll think more about this possibility in the second half of the lecture. But I want to pause here and consider why 1973 has become such a key moment for Marxists interested in periodizing the post-war history of capital. As both Brenner and Arrighi have argued, the 1973 recession marked the decisive moment at which an already sputtering global economy abruptly lurched into a process of large-scale restructuring. This shift signaled the beginning of the end for American hegemony and its organization of the capitalist world system ushering in a protracted period of economic stagnation and contraction in the West. In the wake of the 1973 oil shock and the collapse of the Bretton Woods Agreement in the same year following the Nixon shock of 71, the 1973 stock market crash made evident at an economic level what the fall of Saigon in 1975 would subsequently demonstrate at the level of geopolitics. The post-war economic order was unraveling, and the American century was in a profound state of crisis. After World War II, the leading capitalist economies enjoyed what Arrighi describes as a worldwide virtuous cycle of high profits, high investments, and increasing productivity. But as Brenner argues, between the years of 65 and 73, as output rates in Germany and Japan caught up with their US counterparts, what had previously been, quote, a symbiosis, if a highly conflictual and unstable one, of leader and followers, of early and later developers, and of hegemon and hegemonized, became a zero-sum game of cutthroat competition. Global profit rates plummeted. 
the response of governments and industry leaders in the advanced capitalist countries to the steep fall in profitability across major sectors of the economy only exacerbated the crisis, plunging the global economy into extended decline. So what happened? Brenner and Arrighi both offer their own distinct accounts of this moment of transition. Against so-called supply-side explanations, which tie falling profit rates after the post-war boom to wage inflexibility, understood exogenously as, quote, vertical, that is to say market and socio-political power relations between capitalists and workers, Brenner stresses the centrality of the economic contradictions that, quote, arise from the horizontal competition among firms that constitutes the capitalist system's economic mainspring, end quote, in bringing about the extended crisis of the long downturn. In Brenner's account, capitalists are subject to competitive constraints that compel them to innovate, accumulate, and move from line to line in search of the highest returns. But over time, these same constraints tend to trap firms in stagnant lines, placing downward pressure on extant profit rates. His description of the transition from boom to downturn details what he describes as, quote, a historical pattern of uneven development and international competition, end quote, whereby the process by which German and Japanese manufacturing outputs caught up with productivity rates in the U.S., and this process first sustains and then undermines the post-war boom. In other words, the transformation had dealt within the conditions of the expansion itself. As Germany and Japan played catch up with the U.S., higher cost incumbent American firms found that their large scale investments in fixed capital, which had previously afforded them a competitive advantage in the global economy, now prevented them from abandoning their increasingly unprofitable lines or scaling back on production without suffering catastrophic losses. This crisis of what we might call capital density is what Brenner describes in terms of, quote, overcapacity and overproduction, end quote. A crisis of capital density requires what economists term a shakeout. But in the years following the 73-75 recession, a, quote, wide-ranging system of mutual support ultimately guaranteed by the government, which protected core industrial and financial corporations from going out of business, allowed higher cost incumbent firms to avoid purging superfluous high cost means of production by the standard capitalist methods of bankruptcy, downsizing and layoffs. Commodity production continued to pace, tightening the profitability squeeze. Brenner describes this state of affairs as a situation in which there is simultaneously too much entry and too little exit. Because an incumbent firm's fixed capital quote can be realized only in their established lines of production and will be lost were they to switch lines, they'll have every reason to defend their markets and counterattack by speeding up the process of innovation through investment in additional fixed capital. The adoption of such a strategy on the part of the firms originally caught with the high costs will tend to provoke the original cost-cutting innovators to accelerate technical change themselves, further worsening the already existing overcapacity and overproduction. So here you can see kind of the core of Brenner's thesis. Faced with a rapidly devaluating dollar, Brenner notes, the US government executed a series of policy moves. So the Volcker shock and the Reagan Thatcher monetarist revolution of 79 to 81, the Plaza Accord of 85 and the so-called reverse Plaza Accord of 1995, which would inflate the financial booms and bubbles of the 90s and 2000s, deferring the shakeout until the reckoning of 2008. Even after the dot-com bubble burst in 2001, there's yet another deferral, and one could argue, in fact, that there was a deferral following the 2008 reckoning, and perhaps we are now following the coronavirus recession, which is only really just beginning to open up in front of us, about to enter the real kind of shakeout. In any case, we can see how the persistence of stagnation follows from the manner in which businesses and governments responded to falling profitability between the years of 65 and 73 initially, and then in the decades following the 73 to 75 recession, worsening the dynamics that underwrite overcapacity and overproduction and bringing about an extended squeeze on profitability. If Brenner details the economic and political mechanisms by which the post-war U.S. industrial economy swung dramatically from boom to crisis and got stuck there, dragging the whole thing down with it, Arrighi situates the long downturn in world historical perspective. 
tying declining profit rates and the collapse of Bretton Woods to the mounting costs of the Vietnam War, and shifting focus from the crisis of manufacture in the advanced capitalist countries to the financialization of the capitalist world system. Arighi argues that, quote, the crisis of profitability that marked the transition from the long boom to the long downturn, as well as the great stagflation of the 1970s, so the combination of stagnation and inflation, theoretically impossible according to Keynesian models, uh, were themselves deeply affected by the parallel crisis of American hegemony, which ensued from the escalation of the Vietnam War and the eventual U.S. defeat, end quote. So the escalation of the war in Vietnam and the rising costs of the conflict, both politically and economically, were de decisive, according to Origi, in both the breakdown of the gold standard and the subsequent financialization of the global economy. Origi notes that financialization occurs, quote, whenever returns to capital investment in trade and production fall below a certain threshold and intercapitalist competition becomes a zero or even negative sum game. Under these conditions, precisely those which, according to Brenner, have characterized the long downturn, the risks and uncertainties involved in reinvesting incoming cash flows into trade and production are high, and it makes good business sense to use them to increase the liquidity of assets as a defensive or even offensive weapon in the escalating competitive struggle. In the post-73 period, to be sure, staggering profits have been generated in the U.S. financial sector, while profit rates in manufacture have suffered a dramatic decline. In this way, Arigi highlights how deindustrialization and financialization are, in fact, two sides of the same coin. Crucially for Arigi, this declension in industrial growth and the subsequent explosion of finance that together characterize the post-73 U.S. economy are part of a recurrent pattern spanning the long durée of capital accumulation, marking the collapse of the Italian, Dutch, and British financial empires in previous long centuries, giving rise to a fleeting period of restored profitability for the waning hegemon. As Arigi argues, quote, this upturn can be traced to a response to system-wide intensifications of competition that has characterized world capitalism from its earliest pre-industrial beginnings right up to the present. This response consists of a system-wide tendency centered on the leading capitalist economy of the epoch towards the financialization of processes of capital accumulation. Integral to the transformation of intercapitalist competition from a positive into a negative sum game, this tendency has also acted as a key mechanism for restoring profitability, at least temporarily, in the declining but still hegemonic centers of world capitalism. From this standpoint, we can detect resemblances not just between the Great Depression of 1873 to 96 and the long downturn of 1973 to 1973 to 93 but also between the Edwardian Belle Epoque and the U.S. economic revival and great euphoria of the 1990s. So the period of boom uh, in the 1990s, uh, often um, described as the dot-com bubble. So as I mentioned earlier, Arigi turns to Fernand Braudel's theory of the long century to model what he calls systemic cycles of accumulation, and he identifies four cycles, right, each tied to go, uh, geopolitically to a global hegemon, and each divided into three phases held in sway, in turn, by the logics of mercantile, industrial, and financial capital. Each cycle's movement through these three phases follows a seasonal logic of transition, from the blossoming of spring through the flowering of summer and into the decay of autumn, with a brief and final moment of financial flourishing before the sun goes down for good on a global hegemon. Pinpointing 1973 as the signal crisis of the U.S. cycle of accumulation, Arigi recasts Brenner's account of the boom and bubble of the 1990s, during which time the U.S. economy enjoyed a sudden surge in growth, at least on paper, in world historical perspective arguing that the financialization of the capitalist world system in the post-73 period repeats, quote, the tendency for uneven development in Brenner's sense to generate a long boom, followed by a long period of intensifying competition, reduced profitability and comparative stagnation, itself followed by an upturn of profitability based on a financial expansion centered on the epoch's leading economy, end quote. In Origi's model, though, this financial bubble cannot rescue an ailing hegemon, which at the end of each cycle of accumulation must inevitably give way to its successor. 
For Origi, as for Browdell, financialization is a sign of autumn. What distinguishes the present moment of American decline, as Origi himself, as well as a number of other critics have argued, is that there appears to be no new cycle of accumulation on the horizon, no ascending hegemon that might inaugurate a renewed expansion of the capitalist economy on a global scale. A series of candidates have vied for the position, first Japan in the 1980s, before the collapse of the Japanese asset price bubble in 91, and the subsequent long-term stagnation of the Japanese economy, sometimes called Japanification, and since the 2008 uh, financial crisis, a term that has come back along with another term which has come back, secular stagnation from the period of the Great Depression, to describe the kind of ongoing slow growth rates of um, the advanced capitalist core. Um, so first Japan until the Japan suffered that uh, collapse. And then the emerging economies of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, in a kind of multinodal hegemony, only to stumble under the weight of global overcapacity and a high organic composition of capital. In recent years, of course, while other emerging economies have faltered, the Chinese economy has surged ahead and now seems the most auspicious contender for a long 21st century, as Origi himself suggested in the postscript to the second edition of the long 20th century. Since opening up to foreign trade and investment and implementing free market reforms in 1979, right, China has been among the world's fastest growing economies with real annual GDP growth averaging 9.5% through 2018. So that's quite an astounding number. It's also crucial to note that in the years following the 2008 financial crisis, the Chinese economy has transformed, and many people have sort of failed to note this transformation, from an export powerhouse to a domestic consumer market, while trade patterns have shifted from a consumer goods model tied to the advanced capitalist countries to a, capitalist goods mar a capital goods market uh, exporting to emerging economies. So a major, uh, really crucially important transition or set of transitions there. Meanwhile, the Chinese continue to make strides in their international aspirations under the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, One Belt, One Road, a development strategy that seeks to establish a transcontinental single market with China at its center. Despite this remarkable trajectory, however, there are a number of significant problems or contradictions undermining the prospects for a Chinese long 21st century. For one, the rate of GDP growth has slowed considerably from more than 14% in the early 90s to just over 6% in 2019. Still a big number, but still a major slowdown. Then there's the enormous amount of sunk capital tied up in large-scale infrastructure projects, not to mention a growing mountain of national debt, a swelling real estate bubble, the ongoing trade war with the US, and the looming coronavirus recession, to say nothing, of course, of climate change. But perhaps the most damning indicator of Chinese economic prospects is the country's rapid transition from farm to factory to services. So from the uh, primary sector, our agricultural economy, to the tertiary industry, to, uh, to the secondary, sorry, industry, to tertiary, which is to say services, a definitively low growth sector that has ballooned to absorb huge numbers of internal migrants leaving the Chinese countryside for the urban centers as agricultural employment has declined and the industrial sector butts up against limits to absorb new labor inputs. This developmental trajectory actually mirrors that of the advanced capitalist countries, but in a much more condensed time frame, as industrialization for late starters tends to be more capital intensive from the start. And it's this connection between growth and capital density that brings us back to the question of value, a category largely absent in the work of both Brenner and Origi. In other words, in their focus on intercapitalist competition, the analyses offered by Brenner and Origi, as illuminating as they are in tracing the contours of the post-World War II period, or even indeed the long durée of capital accumulation, operate at the level of price and therefore cannot account for the extent to which the current conjecture, conjuncture is defined by a crisis of value. Competition executes the inner laws of capital, Marx writes, but it does not invent them, it realizes them. Here, Marx suggests we can discern in the motion of intercapitalist competition a trace of the operations of capital's secular tendencies, its kind of internal long-term laws and tendencies, 
that the underlying process driving this motion, what Marx calls valorization, capital right is self-valorizing value, remains in the final instance obscured. Threading Brenner, Origi, and Marx's value theoretical account of crisis, Joshua Clover has outlined what he calls an arc of accumulation, quote, rising from commerce with the Industrial Revolution and descending into finance with widespread industrialization with no reversal in view, end quote. Whereas Origi and Brenner focus on intercapitalist competition at the level of price, as Clover reminds us, quote, for Marx's value analysis, the movements of profits are surface phenomena corresponding to an underlying shift in the balance of constant to variable capital, or what we discussed in the first lecture in terms of what Marx calls a rising organic composition of capital. So to sum up that argument about the shape of capitalist development from the first lecture, and to gesture ahead to the final lecture in which we'll discuss the relationship between cycles of accumulation and cycles of struggle, I want to conclude by considering what the end of growth might mean for the possibility of an anti-capitalist politics today. So to sort of put it rather succinctly, um, and this is uh, an argument that we looked at um, in particular in our account of um, real subsumption um, in lecture one, Marx's critique of value offers what I would say are three distinct moments of insight into the logical and historical trajectory of capital accumulation. First, the capitalist form of value as an actually existing abstraction form determines the labor process and its reproduction. Next, in its drive to self-expansion, capital constantly reorganizes the labor process to boost productivity. Finally, through this rationalization of the labor process, capital erodes the very source of value, expelling ex increasing numbers of workers from the production process and thereby slipping inexorably into crisis. So my argument's gonna be that when capital reaches this level of density, the affirmation of labor, which is to say the traditional Marxist project of its liberation and socialization, becomes increasingly difficult to realize. Labor struggles to represent an opposition to capital or to be the agent of its overcoming in an era of deindustrialization, de not simply because it's always already an alienated form of human activity, but because it no longer occupies a structural position within the class relation from which to assert itself as an antagonist. This is the autumnal logic of seasonal torpor for a labor movement in terminal decline. Brenner and Arigi disagree about the extent to which labor militancy brought about the long downturn, as we've seen, but how do they view the consequences of the downturn for anti-capitalist struggle? So Arigi argues that a wave of labor action between 68 and 73 and a subsequent pay explosion play a key role in bringing about, bringing about the long downturn. And he argues that this in turn accounts for the waning of the workers' movement in the late 20th century. So here's Arigi. By the end of the long post-war boom, the leverage of labor in core regions was sufficient to make any attempt to roll it back through a serious deflation far too risky in social and political terms. An inflationary strategy in contrast promised to outflank workers' power far more effectively than international factor mobility could. It was, indeed, the great stagnation come inflation of the 1970s, stagflation as it was called at the time, and its effects on intercapitalist competition and labor capital relations that effectively wore down workers' power in the core, opening the way for its collapse under the impact of the Reagan-Thatcher counter-revolution. Brenner, as we noted above, explicitly rejects the, wave squ the wage squeeze thesis, this is a supply side argument, in which labor militancy plays a key part in triggering the long downturn, arguing that capital can always just look for labor, uh, cheaper labor elsewhere, which of course it did under the uh, rubric of so-called globalization and offshoring and so on and so forth, right? He established in the Maquilladoras, um, um, special economic zones and so forth. Yet Brenner does argue that, quote, by the middle of the 1990s, U.S. corporations had significantly, significantly improved their condition compared to a decade previously, largely by means of extended and brutal processes of rationalization and redistribution, arguing that, quote, manufacturers had over a decade and a half engaged in wave after wave of shakeout, scrapping masses of outdated and redundant plant and equipment, and ejecting tens of thousands of employees, achieving in the process substantial improvements in productiveness, 
and that quote, they had hugely amplified their profits at the expense of workers by means of a decade long freeze on the growth of real wages. So this is sort of despite kind of the more large scale, like kind of totalizing shakeout that Brenner argues was required to kind of restore profitability on a global scale. You have these kind of uh, series of waves of shakeouts among, amongst manufacturers. Um, in, in, in isolated locations that nevertheless has a kind of devastating impact on workers' livelihoods, but also their power uh, uh, to organize um, and challenge capital. So Brenner and Arigi thus agree that the long downturn has had a devastating impact on the lives of working people, undermining their ability to effectively organize to better their working conditions or contest the power of capital, giving way to a new era of rising inequality that a number of economists and historians have dubbed the Second Gilded Age. In Arigi's view, as we've seen, there's a fundamental similarity between the era of American decline and the downturn that marked the decline of British hegemony at the end of the 19th century, a repetition confirmed by, for Arigi by the financial flourishes of both periods. Noting the role of the US Fed in generating the massive asset price bubbles of the late 20th century, which he argues was, a part, was part of, quote, an accelerated shift to the right in the polity as a whole, Brenner too describes the present moment of widespread inequality as a new Gilded Age. What distinguishes the two positions, as I've been arguing, is the emphasis each theorist places on either politics or economics in their accounts of post-73 downturn. In his take on the collapse of labor militancy, Arigi stresses the importance of the neoliberal turn, as it's come to be known in the Reagan-Thatcher era, while Brenner's account of the long downturn highlights the economic basis of political defeat even if he also argues elsewhere that, quote, working people have been ravaged by capitalism in its neoliberal form. So for Brenner, there is an important political dimension to the long downturn, and monetary policy in particular plays a crucial role in giving lower productivity firms the ability to kind of hang on. But his detailed analysis of the advanced capitalist uh, uh, countries in the post-73 period, I think, clearly spells out the death of the historical workers' movement in economic terms. Nevertheless, and despite their differences, both Arigi and Brenner ultimately liken the current downturn to the era of British decline, right, Arigi in terms of um, the way in which this decline is part of a kind of recurrent pattern, and for Brenner in particular, the idea that with rising inequality and certain other kind of political developments, we might describe the present as a kind of new Gilded Age. During the transition from British to US hegemony, however, and I think this will be key, the industrial proletariat was expanding in size and increasing in concentration, a process of mass integration and expansion that would accelerate in the 20th century, whereas in the post-73 period, the proletariat has been defined by expulsion and fragmentation. As Aaron Beninov argues, quote, since 1973, rising precarity has been associated not only with the decline of the welfare state, but also with the slowdown in capital accumulation, a rise in unemployment, and a decline in the availability of industrial jobs, all of which mark off the present from the Gilded Age past." End quote. This distinction will prove crucial in our next discussion on political possibility in the post-1973 period, and so we'll return to this question about the consequences of downturn for a 21st century anti-capitalist politics in the final lecture. Thanks.